Okay, welcome to the Alt Expo, Saturday, the 25th of June, 2011, at Portfest 2011. Uh, our next topic is permaculture, and I'm really glad to see so many people interested in it. Um, you know, some people in the libertarian movement aren't noted to be concerned about the environment or about, you know, crunchy granola things, but I think we're here to, to prove that's uh, not the case. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about the future of our society and of our food chain and all of that. Uh, we have Stephanie Ann Albert here, Dave Noel, and Gina Gans, and they're all at various levels of training in being permaculture practitioners. And I'll let them take it from here. Okay. All right. I, ha I have some notes here. I'm a little nervous. I'm, I have stage Go fright. Stephanie. I have gra grass fright here. So, um, I guess I'll start by saying that I was born and raised in New Hampshire, so I feel at home. Um, I was very young uh, when I realized that our civilization was facing major fundamental problems domestically, locally, and globally. Uh, even though I maybe wasn't uh, able to connect, make connections about why that was, I had more questions about how, why things were the way that they were than answers. Um, in times like this, when the majority of the, glu the global human population has no clean drinking water, um, multinational conglomerates own the genetic material contained in most of the food that we eat. And um, I kind of realized it was really simple and fundamental that we needed to get together to identify alternatives to our current uh, economic and political system. So, um, I decided it was more effective to get people together uh, to have conversations about solutions rather than the problems because people like us are kind of in touch and we kind of know that there's a lot that is wrong right now and we work together we can have positive conversations about how to um, kind of break the code and move ourselves in a more sustainable uh, manner. Um, and then a set of solutions depends on the framing of the problem and you know so I guess the problem is how do we collaborate to work together uh, towards resisting the system um, as it stands while maintain, maintaining resiliency when shit hits the fan and I think a lot of us know that that is happening now so um, I guess we're all going to introduce ourselves and we'll try to define permaculture um, at, we can all agree that there's not a universal definition of permaculture, it's an evolving uh, field. Field. It's kind of an umbrella study. And uh, is there anyone heard of? Oh, I'm assuming there's quite some people here, which is great. I'm really excited. There's this many people here. I didn't know what kind Woo! of thing we had. Thank you all yeah, for coming, guys. Um, I'm assuming at least you're out. sort of familiar with permaculture. I mean. You know, originally it was kind of just more of like a permanent agriculture meeting, and it's sort of morphed more into like a permanent culture. So it's more than just like sort of farming now. It's more about like or ways of organizing society and people and how they can interact and have everyone's needs met. Um, and what I think is kind of what we have a unique opportunity here, I think, to talk about permaculture in sort of a different way than you'd normally hear it. Um, uh, permaculture, it does seem to have a, a granola type save the world um, view. And, you know, that's great. It does do all that stuff. And I would say a lot of people probably in here in Port Press in general, that's not their primary concern. You know, they have certain things that they don't, they question certain things. And what's really great about permaculture, I think, is, is it doesn't even matter if you don't even believe in any of that stuff, because there's still tons of benefits from practicing permaculture that we can get. Um, you know, some of those things are like, you know, independence, so we can grow our own food, minimizing the amount of effort that we have to put into growing the food, you know, maximizing our outputs, um, and, you know, reducing waste, um, you know, reducing the amount of money that we have to spend, and just following sort of those ideas, it doesn't matter, you know, the outcome is, is yeah, we are going to make the, the earth a better place, and the, and the soils are going to be better, and, and the air is going to be better. But even if that's not your primary goal, you know, you're just trying to create better food for yourself and more resilience for yourself. And, um, and all that stuff is just like side effects. And um, for me personally, I started getting interested in, um, well, I mean, about 10 years, I'm a software developer by trade. And about 10 years ago, I found it um, becoming increasingly hard 
to make as much money. Competition was increasing, it was harder to differentiate myself, and that's great, you know, to, have, to do that. But I found it much harder to um, sort of let's squeeze out a living. So I was like, wow, I have to really work a lot harder to get the money that I used to be able to get. And so then I was kind of like wanting to sort of go back to the land a little bit, find ways to grow my own food so I could reduce my expenses. So I was like, okay, I can control that better than I can control these, these marketplaces out there. So I was trying to sort of liberate myself. And so I kind of went down the, the homesteading path and, um, you know, growing your own food. But then in that process, you know, heard about this permaculture thing. And I was like, what is this? And, um, you know, I found it very, um, you know, I like the idea of really saying, okay, I can try to reduce the amount of effort that I have to do and um, work with nature versus trying to fight it, um, take nature as the lead and, and just follow what nature wants. And um, so I could actually sort of just sit back and collect the food. And um, and so I, I really like that idea. And I'm still, it's a work, for me, it's still a work in progress. I mean, I only basically finished my permaculture course last year, but I'm, you know, applying those principles on my um, on my homestead now. And it's, it isn't ever, it's not like you're ever going to know it all and be an expert, total expert in it. It's like a, a living experience. And, um, and, you know, as a computer scientist, you know, I don't have a background in plants and all that. So that's, I'm learning about a lot of that stuff now and how certain plants behave and animals behave and how they act. And, um, that, that was a little bit about me. Okay. Hi, I'm Jenna. Uh, I'll have to apologize if I stumble a little bit. I'm not used to speaking in front of people. I gotta say, Jack is uh, great at inspiring confidence in people because I told him I was a little nervous, and he said, "Ah, oh, don't worry. If you mess up, it's just going to be recorded and posted on YouTube." <laughs> <laughs> so that made me feel a lot better. Um, anyway, I would say I got interested in permaculture about two years ago, um, and I'm about halfway through my PDC, so I'm sort of the, the noob here. Um, but I've realized in my limited studies how important permaculture is for a number of reasons. And in my opinion, it's especially important to people who value their liberty. Um, you know how they say, no farms, no food. Well, no food, no freedom. Think of how empowering it is to grow your own food, to be involved in a process of creation. Especially for those of us who have children, I think that gardening is a really great opportunity to both bond with your children, empower them by involving them in a process of creation, and you get to spend more time with them than you would if you were working a nine to five. Um, you know, and think of the money you save and the money you can make. I actually have a friend who has a quarter acre of land and he makes about $10,000 a year after taxes on what he grows on that tiny little postage stamp of land. Um, so the opportunities are really limitless. Um, and I think though that if you truly want to have a free society, you have to be in control of your own food supply. You have to empower yourself. And you know, even if you don't have room to garden or time to garden, I think the best thing you can do is to find local farmers who can provide you with those things that you can't provide or grow for yourself. Um, because when you know your source, you have the most power that way. So I think permaculture and liberty are two concepts that are really intertwined in a way. Amen. So, um, so permaculture is really a huge topic. So it can be yeah. hard to really describe certain things, yeah. but we can certainly, in general, also like permaculture is really like a design system. It's right. like a whole design system where you're trying to look at whether it's your home site or, you know, whether you live in the city or out in the country. It really doesn't matter. You look at what's around you. You um, look at your whole system. Maybe you look at things that like um, your desires that you'd like to have. Just maybe you like certain kinds of foods or you like certain things and you want to have those in your surroundings around you, you know, you sort of design your whole living space around those concerns. And so you look at like things within your system, like um, uh, one thing you kind of do a lot of times is like um, a, niche, a niche analysis, which is sort of like um, you look at all your elements in your system and like um, a typical standard permaculture textbook case is looking at a chicken and you say, okay, I want to have chickens because I like the fresh eggs and I like the meat. You know, like, okay, well, what does a chicken need to live? You know, well, it's going to need food. It's going to need some, like, um, water. It's going to need some sort of shelter. It's going to need uh, maybe some dirt to, like, take, like, a dirt bath in and clean itself up. And it's going to need certain things. But at the same time, it also provides things. So, you know, it provides eggs. It provides meat. It provides... Manure for compost. <coughs> yeah, manure, um, <laughs> CO2, 
um, all sorts of things. So you need to say, okay, that's what it, what it provides, and then you try to sort of line it up with other things in your system. So you look at what other items might provide. And um, so a lot of times you see in the standard cases, like um, say a greenhouse. Well, you go, okay, I want to grow some food in a greenhouse. So what you know, what type of plants that are in there? They usually need heat, right? Because you're trying to actually increase the heat in the greenhouse. Well, yeah, well chickens provide heat. So maybe you should have your chicken coop like sort of co-located with your greenhouse, so the chickens are actually putting off some heat into the, to the greenhouse. And at the same time, you know, they're exhaling. CO2 and then the plants are breathing that stuff and so what you try to do is maximize those number of the cooperation there so it's really not about um, competition it really is about finding ways for things to cooperate with each other and that's sort of how you can jump start and get that um, the biggest bang for your buck so you don't have to do so much because there's just so many little things interacting in, in a positive way and cooperating with each other that they're really doing a lot of the work for you right yeah. Like, actually, a really good example. Has anyone here heard of the concept, the Native American concept of the three sisters? Mm -hmm. Right. You plant your corn, your beans, your squash all together, and it works out a lot better than it would if you grew those crops, if you monocropped, basically. Grew just one crop in one area year after year, which actually robs the soil of nutrients eventually. And going off of what Jenna's saying, actually, uh, there's, a, there's a perennial three sisters here in permaculture. Uh, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Jerusalem artichokes. They are, uh, what is it? Uh, I, I can't remember the Latin name, but they're a native sunflower and they have edible roots. They attract bees to your property. And as some of you might know, bees play an important role in the natural ecology of the area. Um, with uh, ground nuts, which is a vine, nitrogen fixing vine that will grow up the Jerusalem artichoke flower. And then violets, as a ground cover. So the violets will prevent evaporation of the water um, in the soil. They will provide food, and, and you can eat the leaves and the flowers, beauty. And they also fix nitrogen. So you can have this perennial closed loop system, this food that's taking care of itself. You don't even need to water it. You can come to Pork Fest. You don't even need to get your neighbor to, maybe your neighbor is coming to Pork Fest too. You don't need to get anyone to water your garden because you think about each and every plant, each and every element on your, in your site, you think of uh, the role that it will have in your property, what it, its needs are, what its yields are, and then you can decide is it really worth implementing here. Um, so we were talking about, uh, you know, what are your needs or what are your desires, what do you want to get from your property, and a lot of times uh, that's one of the, the underlying uh, determinants on, on how you're going to design your property, but another one is the site itself. The site will inform what you can grow or what you can do there. If you have 10 acres, well, you have a little bit more, uh, <laughs> I guess, room to play with, literally, but you can live in the city. There are people in New York City, they're going in with public works uh, costumes on at night, they're jackhammering uh, abandoned lots, they're getting rid of that concrete, they're sheet mulching, they're starting to build soil, they're, they're planting trees and they're out of there, you know. <laughs> I mean, that happens. That's air right there, guys. I mean, that's what I plan on doing. But, uh, you know, you got to think about how much sun you actually get on your property. If you, uh, if you don't have a lot of sun on your property, don't, then don't try to grow tomatoes. If you don't like tomatoes, then don't try to grow tomatoes to impress your neighbors. Um, think about what food you like. Think about, you know, if, if your soil is healthy and fertile and, you know, if it's not, there are plants and there are, there are living organisms that will help build that soil uh, before you, know, you start growing food there. Um, it's a good idea to get your soil uh, tested because there's a lot of synthetic chemicals that are resting in soil that are unable to break down and you might have to bring, bring in some, some uh, living organisms to fix that soil. I don't know if you guys are in, um, have ever heard of microremediation. Um, or bioremediation. It's remediation of toxic soil using living organisms such as bacteria or fungi. You bring fungi in and it will either absorb those nutrients or those uh, heavy metals and those toxic chemicals, pharmaceuticals, that you can, uh, the, that you can remove this stuff and put it somewhere, toxic waste, waste dump. Or it will get in there like petrochemicals. Fungi has the ability to break down those petro petrochemicals into organic compounds that, hell, your plants might like, you might use as food. So it's really just a systematic uh, approach to designing you know, food production systems, water management systems, 
energy production systems um, that you know you can you can really get off the grid in every way, shape, and form. Not just from the energy production system, but you can produce, you can clean your own, own water on site. You can have your innovative septic systems, gray water uh, systems that will take care of some of that toxic waste on your site and uh, turn it into something productive. So, and you can grow food anywhere if you have a porch. Yep. I have a question. Yeah. Um, where do you get hold of some of the uh, products, uh, you know, microbes and, you know, bacteria and things like that? I work in a garden center and our, you know, amendment section of our store is pretty small. Um, we don't really have anything to alter the soil from, you know, within. Um, you know, we tell people that compost and things like that. So we're about, you know, gardening. You know, we don't really have a lot of um, farming type stuff. So not a lot of large scale things like that. So what would you recommend for just, let, you know, say a, a small home garden? Like what would you do like if you have really crappy soil and, um, you know, you don't want to just cool. get rid of it you want to add something to it? Well, as you were asking that question, uh, it really depends on the minerals that you want to bring in. But the plant that comes to mind for me is comfrey. Uh, Symphytum officinalis, and it, uh, what it, it's like a weed. There's a lot, of, like, there's weeds all over the place that we can use. There's plantain right in front of me, and that's a medicinal herb. But so, comfrey is this crazy, like, green shrub that you see growing wild a lot. And what it does is that we'll grow it anywhere, but it has a tap root and it goes deep within the soil. And if you don't uh, disturb its roots, it will stay put, it won't, it won't take over. Once you start hacking at its roots, it will shoot up plants everywhere. But it will go up to 15 feet underground. It will pull up potassium, calcium, bunch of stuff. nitrogen. I mean, it will pull up everywhere, everything from deep inside. It will literally mine away at minerals, at hard rock, and atom by atom, pull it up into the foliage, and then you throw that in your compost. You mulch your, you mulch your tomatoes with it, and it's instant. You know, you can put a comfrey plant next to a tomato plant. You just kind of cut off the leaves. So and you can yeah. work with the garden oh, yeah. as that's growing. You don't have to like plant it one year and then you know pull it up the next. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And it's always good to know a little bit about each plant. Like uh, Dave mentioned, the niche analysis, and it goes for chickens as much it would, as it would plants. go for plants, as much as it would go for a built structure like a shed. Um, you just think about the inputs and the outputs. But um, where the heck was I going with that? <laughs> for, yeah, for the soil, it really depends too on what you want to do. I mean, if you're doing like a garden that's close to your house, it's small scale, um, and if you're doing like annuals, well, I'd say yeah, you know, I probably wouldn't want to spend a lot of money on changing the soil there. I'd probably bring in, do some raised garden beds, keep it small, and bring in some new good soil that just lays on top of the ground. Yeah. And um, you know, for other longer term things, is definitely permaculture really kind of focuses on perennial plantings because. And it's like plant wants kind of get it established and then you just don't really have to do too much. Um, now, unfortunately for our society, we're not really too used, used to too many perennial plants that we eat. There's a few things that we're used to, but there's a lot of stuff out there that, that are totally edible, but we're just not really exposed to them. But for those type of things, if you have like really bad soil in those places, I don't know if I'd bring in any type of amendments at all. I would maybe go the route of planting some type of, uh, those are like comfrey or, you know, doing something with some clovers or nitrogen fixes or something. And I might also grow a bunch of stuff that you don't want to grow long term, but maybe it will grow very well in the type of soil that you currently have. So during that process of trying to switch it over, maybe you just grow something that, yeah, it's okay, I can eat it or I have a use for it, but it's not my long term plan and you just kind of use it to get something in, in the meantime. Um, and a lot of times when you're choosing plants to grow in your garden, whether you live in New Mexico, New Hampshire, wherever, Canada, there are definitely an assortment of plants anywhere you go. And you want each plant to serve around three functions, perennial plant, so you're not really putting in much energy into its success. You want, whether it be food production, medicine production, improvement of soil, um, bringing wildlife into your yard, beauty and aesthetics. Um, Usually you really try to start, a lot of times actually there are plants that are called insectaries, it's another function that a plant can serve, and it will attract, you know, the Japanese beetles or whatever to that plant. And then so the rest of your plants will be fine because they prefer this insectary, this insect attractor over your 
prize begonias or whatever it is. Yeah, like and it's it's real cool, and it might be beautiful. It might serve a few other uh, functions as well. And hell knows, you know. It might help build your soil as well. So it's really important to decide which plants you want to put in your garden and think outside the box. There's a lot of resources that will give you information about you know what plants will do well and what they'll provide for you. And then, yeah, and it's not, you know, like you're saying, it's not really just about planning. It is about even building structures of you know, your home. Um, and you could do really go like a whole like natural building route, or you could kind of go the modern green route. You know, and the reason why you know why you do that stuff is is to save energy. And um, so, you know, you put in maybe a little bit of money now, but you know, you get the return in the in the long term. You, know, you get the good bang out of it. And um, you know, a lot of natural building, it's it's pretty cool. Personally, I don't really have any experience with it, and you know, I have my house already, so it's. That's what it is, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna put in some natural type of, you know, insulation or do something totally different. But maybe if I was building a house from scratch, I would definitely consider that stuff. Um. I guess I want to talk a little bit more about stacking functions and inputs and outputs of a structure, because we've been talking a lot about biological processes and biological beings and things. So you want to build a shed. You're like, I need a shed because I need, you know, I have all these tools, and my wife's like, oh, what the hell, honey, like, get your tools outside, They're, you're tracking mud inside. So you got to build a tool shed. You know, why not integrate that with a, uh, a greenhouse, orient it, uh, have it towards uh, southern, the south, so make sure that you get prime sunlight. You can grow food inside of that greenhouse, you can have an effective way to store your tools, you might have a bike storage in there, you might catch water off of that and use that for the garden next door. You might... Uh, have a green roof on that. I mean, you can. The idea is really like efficiently using every square inch of your property um, to fit your needs and your wants. So, um, what's a green roof? A green roof? Oh, okay. good question. All right. Good question. Does anyone? Else? A green roof is is simply just a a, a roof that uh, you grow food on. You, you utilize that surface, that great. Ex uh, solar exposure to grow to grow food or right. whatever you want and it has multiple benefits too because the vegetation helps to keep your house insulated so especially for those of you with like black rubber roofs it doesn't get too crazy hot in the summer or too cold in the winter uh, you know it catches rainwater so that's less stuff going down your downspouts and possibly flooding your basement it has uh, multiple purposes yeah! <laughs> cool. So, there's so many different elements that can be considered permaculture. I have a friend who picks on me all the time because it's really just about sustaining culture, sustaining our way of life. And so if I, like, we carpool or something, we're saving gas, right? So he says, that's still permaculture. He picks on me, every little thing that I do. But uh, there's, and then all of us have a unique set of interests and we all live in different climates, more or less. Even though Dave and I both live in New Hampshire, but I live in the mountains, and he lives a little, a little further south. He might be able to grow some of the plants that I'm not even able to grow in, in northern New Hampshire. But uh, yeah, and permaculture too has some other neat aspects to it too, which I think would really go over well with the whole community here. Is I mean, they recognize that a lot of people don't have access to um, sort of money in certain ways. The way the system is sort of set against them, or the banks and everything. So they're you know kind of permaculture is big into like barter, alternative currencies, and finding ways for people to actually en enable commerce so they can have their needs met and, do, and sh you know, buy and sell things with each other and trade. Um, so, you know, usually you don't think of stuff like that, but, you know, growing food, you're not thinking of alternative currencies, but permaculture actually includes that as well. Uh, two questions. Number one, um, I, I, I'm sure there's a wealth of information out there in permaculture. Can you talk a little bit about the different resources, how to learn about it? Maybe there's also different levels, like if you know a little bit about plants versus like a newbie type person. And then secondly, um, what are, I guess maybe, maybe you can talk about the areas that you live. Are there threats to your ability to um, conduct permaculture from local zoning? You, know, you hear about these uh, cases of like people getting in trouble for having chickens or what have you. Yeah. Um, That's a really good couple of questions. So, introduction to permaculture. Let's see, what, what books do you guys suggest? We have a little bit more of an advanced resource right. that we were all discussing earlier. Um, a lot of people look at Bill Mollison as like the father of permaculture, and that is partially true, but David Holmgren was actually instrumental in, uh, in 
I guess, ideal for creating, and has had the system that was eventually called permaculture. I think his book, um, it's called Permaculture, Principles and Pathways to Sustainability. I think that's a really good starting point. Um, Bill Mollison's introduction of permaculture is really good, but it's also very dense, and the print is very small, and it's a pretty thick book. So um, I would say it's good as a reference tool, but I really liked uh, what David Holmgren had to wrote. And, and and right. Mollison's book too. I mean, he came out of Australia basically, so some of his stuff is more for very arid weather. Right. You know how to save water, and um, you know, it's important stuff. But around here, we got a lot of water sometimes, right. and you got to find ways to actually find uses for it in some right. cases. Oh, uh, and also for those who are interested in like home scale permaculture specifically, um, I would recommend. Um, which one was written by Toby Hemingway? Gaia's Garden. Gaia's Garden. Totally. I was, yeah. was going to suggest that. Was that was a really good well. one. And also, uh, there's a fella, he actually lives here in New Hampshire. Um, he doesn't call it permaculture, <laughs> but it involves a lot of I principles of permaculture. <laughs> and it's called mini farming, self sufficiency on a quarter acre. It's by a man named Brett Markham. It's really good. And Brett actually maintains a website called Markham Farm where he will actually answer any questions you might have about intensive agriculture. I've, um, add to that list, there's a website called Earth Action Mentor that I actually, I'm not involved with it. It costs five or ten bucks a month, but I've heard great things about it. Um, right. They sort of take relevant information from a lot of sources, and the service that, you're, that one pays for is the sort of organization of that. Then they also have conference calls sometimes and things like that. Right. Do you know if there's like an online directory for like the PD where people can find PDCs? Because for those who might want some like hands-on training, there is. I there are so many depending on where where you live. There's a, a Northeast Permaculture Institute that has a really great database of happenings and gatherings and uh, information exchange gatherings, I guess. But um, there's a couple other resources I just want to mention real quick too. Um, Personally, the books that I like the best are the um, Edible Forest Gardens oh, by um, yes. Dave, Jackie, yeah. and Eric. Um, Collins Meyer. Yeah. So he, they're, what I really like about them is, um, we can talk about Edible Forest Gardens, what that is in a minute, but they wrote that book and they were living in the Keene area at the time. So it's very specific to this area. It's so if you live in New Hampshire, a lot of that stuff that they've done really applies here to this, this climate. And... Um, there are two volumes. There's a theory uh, yeah, it's, volume. It's not an intro thing. No. It's, no, it's not really necessarily an introduction, but it will blow your mind and you'll enjoy it. And then there's also a practice a manual. And there's so many figures and, and charts and amazing resources in that book. Yes, sir. Well, speaking of resources, why don't you tell everybody about D.H. Yeah. G. Acres Farm? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm okay. Gonna, a, a well, I <laughs> wanted to finish answering this gentleman's question because there was a second piece to his question about zoning, and I definitely have like some input on that and some experience a little bit because I'm working within a university system right now, and it's quite the bureaucracy. And there's a lot of red tape, but we're doing some cool stuff anyway. But um, so D. Acres Organic Farm and Educational Homestead is in Dorchester, New Hampshire. It's a, an extremely incredible place. They're not here because the, it's a farm. Actually, no. Matt, why don't you say something about D Acres? Sorry to put you on the spot. D Acres is an incredible permaculture site. They got all kinds of experiments going on. They are, they have uh, solar energy. They got, they got so many cool, innovative technology, technologies. They're basically off the grid. They. Uh, I mean, they are an absolutely incredible, resilient uh, site, and they're an amazing place to check out, and they have, gosh. They have yeah. classes, too, which is nice. So they'll have little things, and, you know, they, they actually do offer permaculture classes there, and you know, a permaculture class is a pretty big commitment. You take, it's a big time commitment. Mm -hmm. But they also have things like, um, what is it, like uh, dandelion wine making and different things, you know, so Working they have with some wood. cool stuff. Well, yeah. a thing. It's making not a biochar. Art. Biochar. <laughs> Biochar. I want to talk about that, but that's like, this, this isn't a permaculture conference, so we won't talk about that, unless you guys want to hear about it. Yeah. I'll talk about it. <laughs> Who wants to hear about biochar? All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who wants to start? I love biochar. I know. I'm so what about the zoning? The zoning. Yeah. yeah let's oh, yes, yeah, zoning. Yeah. I think it depends on where you live. I mean, you're, in, you're kind of in the city, so it's not that great. I, and I live in Canterbury, which is very rural. I mean, there is zoning. It's like not as good as like Graft in that regard, but they're super farmer friendly. So everything's good. You know, I can do whatever I want. Basically, no one knows, and no one really cares anyway. You know, as long as I'm not building super buildings with you know industrial stuff. I'm good farming. I don't care. 
Um, one thing I think would be interesting to see about zoning would be um, um, one thing we don't really do a lot of here is we kind of talked about it a little bit was um, you know composting your your poop basically and your urine and um, instead of having a septic system, closing the loop. Um, I could see some issues there with like zoning type stuff and if you're trying to build a house you definitely they're not going to like it probably that you're not putting a septic system in depending on the town you're going to have to do some finagling there but that's a huge expense you can save right there and why put in a septic system when you can actually collect your waste and actually reprocess it and feed it right back into your system right and then why do why pay for someone to take it away you know a lot of these folks might have fecal phobia so i don't yeah. know if you should go into this <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little edgy it's a terrible culture we definitely start. talk about where shit goes a lot because it's, a, it's, it's not it's an open like it's not a closed loop system and it's a really inefficient system we're just dumping it into our rivers and we're dumping it into our yeah we're really it's just it's just yeah. we're but, not utilizing it but another thing too about zoning is say for the chickens yeah i mean the chickens, like, um, if, you, if you want to do civil disobedience, yeah, get some chickens in a town and they don't allow it. Odds are, right now in this environment, you're going to win that battle, no problem at all. You know, everyone's going to stand behind you, and you're going to win that, and, you know, and it'll change it, and you'll be able to have chickens there. Yeah, sometimes you're really just, certain things people choose to work within the system, and they might, you know, get a petition at all their neighbors if they want to go through that trouble, and sometimes they... Uh, the town will be a little more lenient if you say you're not going to get roosters, because sometimes roosters are the problem because they make a lot of noise. So there's that. And then in Plymouth, where I live, they, I think the allowance is six chickens, six female chickens, hens. And uh, you consider them pets and you have to name them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, where, that's where it stands right now. So, um, they you stop know. buying us to name some Yeah, exactly, you know. So that's that. Um, <laughs> I think one of the biggest zoning uh, fights is definitely has to do with uh, compost systems and mm. black water management, gray water management, constructed wetlands, c kinds of things. Some more innovative uh, ways to deal with your refuse, <laughs> I guess. Um, and it's unfortunate because some of the best oil in the world, they call it uh, Terra Preta. It's in the, they found it in Amazon recently, um, and it's, it's literally like biochar, as we were talking about a little bit, human waste and like fragments of um, pottery that, you know, the, cult, the, uh, the trash, South American cultures, exactly. And so it's the best oil in the world. And uh, the thing about using our waste is, is the pharmaceuticals and uh, a lot of these toxic uh, compounds, pesticides, herbicides that we put in our bodies. And if they, you know, if they don't stay in our tissue and stay with us and get passed on to our offspring, which is the case, usually, it will go get into our fecal matter and then into our soil, and it's these these toxic macromolecules that aren't able to break themselves down. Right. Didn't you already have a solution for that earlier? We did. <laughs> we did. So, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> at any point Although I am going to say for those for whom the idea of human humanure is a little too edgy, you do not have to shit on your crops to have a <laughs> no, successful no, garden. No, no, like, it's not like that. Anybody is capable of successfully doing some bio-intensive gardening and getting a good yield. Well, not only that, but you can skip a year. You know, what or comes two or out three. of you one year can right. end up on the plants. Right. Yeah, it's definitely so multi-year. It's a multi-year process. Yeah, and I mean, I don't have a, a human or system. I, I mean, I have an existing house that has a septic system, but and I'm not going to retrofit the house. I'm not going to do it. But if I was building a house, yeah, I would. I would definitely try to avoid the septic system, save all that money, and then use this stuff. Yeah, because we have this constant urge in permaculture to close every loop, nutrient right. cycling, and in every loop, make sure that our water's clean and we know where our food's coming from and all the chemicals involved and, and we just try to close all the leaks. So right. that's why we go waste off on is one of the like most important principles of permaculture in my opinion. <coughs> wow, there's so many things we could talk about. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering if uh, we might want to talk about a little more about the strategy behind permaculture. I'm seeing I'm wondering if a lot of the permaculture community might be getting a little bit too far ahead of itself. A lot of people are devoting a huge amount of energy into taking classes and to learning how to garden a small a lot of land, but is that, as agorists, as anarchists, is that really an effective strategy for getting to where we want to be? And I'm starting to question that a lot. I'm, this whole region, the whole Northeast, used to be one giant garden. The Indians were, were managing, the trees were being managed by them, as, and they were a keystone species. They'd burn out what they didn't want, they, they'd promote the plants they did want, then they'd move along with the the different crops and harvest them. And there is still a huge amount 
out there that's not being utilized, that's not even being remotely tended, that is extremely valuable, not just as a food source, but as a medicine source. There are, especially in the fall here, there are the, the medicinal mushrooms that come up, whether they're Amanita muscaria or the shaga that's growing on the white birch tree, they're everywhere. Nobody's, GP, nobody's GPS plotting them. Nobody's putting together a work crew to go pick them. And they're selling for $75 a pound on eBay or more. And that could be funding a whole community if, if we could figure out how to use what's already there and maybe do a little raking here and there, cut back a few trees. But, I mean, if we're looking to really, if we're serious about this, wouldn't we want to invest our, our energy where it's going to get the most return? And that might not be on your my six acres, you know, in the woods. Absolutely. That, that doesn't that, that yeah, it's got some beech nuts growing around here and there that I could, you know, maybe support a little bit. But shoot, there's there's thousands and thousands of acres out there that nobody's using, that's nobody's taking advantage of. And I don't have to invest hardly any energy to get those up to a place where I can be, you know, having a whole crew go through and and uh, wild crafting, berries, whatever, and uh, maybe focus on my side creating like a, a wild restaurant or something like that. While your neighbor is 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 has ra raising draft horses to do some of the work, logging and, and whatever, everyone has their own niche and everyone's working mm -hmm. together to manage the land together. I really like where you're getting at. Do you guys have anything to say? Because I have I have so many great like things to add to that. <laughs> I, I don't know, I guess I just I really like one strategy. Yeah. Like yeah. where are we why are we putting all of our energy into into a permaculture that has very little return a lot of the time on investment when there's there's these natural environments out there that are producing food already that maybe need just a little tweaking and mm -hmm. boom they're producing twice as much as your home garden. Absolutely. Like there are autumn berries that grow all over this state that produce millions of pounds of this nutritious lycopene berry that are extremely easy to harvest. You put a tarp underneath and you shake the bush, they fix nitrogen in the soil, they're there already. I mean, but are we, why aren't we harvesting them? Blueberry, abandoned blueberry fields. Oh, a lot like of people that. are. I, I, I have friends yeah. in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I live, who harvest service berries from tr trees in the city and are selling them for like five bucks a pint. And that's really valuable yeah. to permaculture. That's very important. Utilizing the resources that are already there. I don't know a single person who calls himself a permaculturist who doesn't get like really excited when I mention like edible you know, wild edibles. Yeah. yeah. I'm really into foraging myself. I mean, I'm like a woman of the woods. I'm in the right. woods any moment that I'm not doing anything else. And I really like what you're saying because if you're in, on your own property, um, using all of your energy and your own resources to just like help your own plants grow, then you're not really doing anything else, doing anything for the earth or for anyone else. And I'm really actually become really interested in, in community-based uh, permaculture systems. The permaculture model is definitely not like just a family-based or like an individual-based model. You can have permaculture communities and also another scale, there's so many scales and models within permaculture, is, is there's a scale of one to seven where seven is, you know, digging a hole and pouring concrete into it and then one is going into the woods and foraging, not right. touching anything and utilizing the resources that are already there, wild crafting. And so every step that you move away from the natural environment and natural ecosystems as it stands, you're, you are, as a human, adjusting the natural ecosystem more or less to, for your own benefit or for your community's benefit. But you can create c entire communities based upon nat uh, native species native productive species that serve functions for yourself um, and each person can spend time working on their own skills whether it be like working with metal or working with what am I trying to say like fabric um, textiles such as you know spinning wool and knitting for all the men who are going out and like foraging or hunting or whatever so it's really you can um, adjust permaculture perspective to any size community and whether it be an individual family or a community. I'm actually working on a project right now it's called uh, Elder Living Community and it's kind of a paradigm shift from the current um, assisted living or assisting, assisted dying elder communities where a lot of our, um, our loved ones who are old, a lot of people dispose of them in a way that they're like, oh they're, you know, they, they're going to the bathroom uncontrollably, they need to be like put in a nursing home and taken care of until they pass away. Well, no. 
we need to um, embrace these these people who are full of wisdom and hear their stories and give them opportunities to continue learning until they pass away and help, teach them how to grow their own food and make their own wine and teach them how to ballroom dance and um, it's really just everyone taking care of each other um, finding their own niche and ensuring that everyone has all the resources that they need the food their water their and their community and love <laughs> but that's my own perspective <laughs> I just wanted to put something in too about the, the sort of like the wild crafting and you know is I mean what I kind of view permaculture too is I mean even in those environments when I mean, you're still using the concepts of permaculture to maybe help along the the wild woods right. you know help it where Zone you can four. and um, but you know it's also just like general activism I mean what works what doesn't work it's sort of different for every individual um, I mean for your own property you definitely have at least in our society today we have total control over you know, with some zoning issues maybe, but in general we have a lot of control over what we do. When you kind of start spreading into, say, some common, the commons out in some forest, then you're going to get a lot of people saying, well, I don't, what's this guy doing out here and doing all this stuff? And maybe they agree, maybe they don't, and uh, maybe you decide just to do it anyway to try and make it better, but, you know, you're going to get some backlash, I'm sure. And, um, you know, it w I'm sure it would be very frustrating if you're trying to do all this stuff and then some authorities come down and crack down and say, we don't care, you know, we're just going to you don't have authority to be here and we're not going to let you be here even though no one's there and it's just the woods you know um but you know i do see the value of just even doing the home the, the, the per your personal home site because you know you're, you're creating this environment you're making a little patch of the world um better um you're also creating sort of a haven for insects and bugs and wildlife to actually <coughs> maybe cross Fun through your, your your property and go somewhere else so you're you're, you're creating like a, a path for them mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been there and maybe now they can kind of go find out find their way into the woods or something and they couldn't before or something you know and the more people that do that you have more of these interconnections and so i do think it is it is important to do on the home scale because if en enough right. people do that you know if, if i'm the only one doing it in the whole world yeah i doesn't do a huge impact but if enough people start doing that and we kind of convince society as a whole that there's a lot of values in doing this and people say yeah this is cool I like this you know whether I'm gonna <coughs> save the world or I'm just gonna provide more food for myself we're all doing it and uh, for different reasons but we're doing the same thing and it's all coming together yeah, we're, and also um, like to address your concern about well why isn't everybody just foraging in the forest why why should we bother growing our own food well, there's a really simple and obvious answer is that there are a lot of people out there who don't really live within a reasonable distance of a forest to be doing this foraging. And, you know, there's some foraging that can be done even in a city setting, like where I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. There are fruit and berry trees all over the place, and nobody seems to really be claiming ownership of them, so I walk around, pick some berries. Um, but also, I think that, you know, a little tweaking with wild places is okay, but I also believe that we really need to cherish the wild places we have left you know, harvest, but not tweak. And when it comes to a home space, the yield of a design, like the yield of food you get, is theoretically limited only by your imagination. Whereas the forest, it does its own thing, it's well established, which is great for what it is. But when you're growing on your own land, there really are no limits except for the, the ones in your head. The forest around here, though, isn't wild, and I mean, it's not right. very, there's it's like, true. there are maybe 1% of all of New Hampshire that has old growth forest, maybe 0.5%. Yeah. A lot of the, the rest old growth of it forest was in the world. Logged, you right. know, and what they let come back was not the way this forest used to be. It right. used to be one giant garden. Right. And, and I'm not talking about doing a lot of changes to it, uh, but that that would be its natural wild state we are part of this natural environment we're not separate animals from right. it and, and and maximizing its yield is what it really kind of well wants us to do i guess would right. be a way to say it because we are part of it also the i don't think the risks are that great of actually going out into the woods and the commons and doing the wild crafting doing the mild right. I, know, I i've done the great. riskiest possible form of that right. by harvesting Amanita muscaria mushrooms all along the sides of the roads all over New Hampshire. Right. A hallucinogenic mushroom that's illegal, but still, you know, I, the cops would stop and wonder what was going on. Right. You know, and all I had to do was tell them, hey, this is, you know, this, this is an edible mushroom, and yeah, I've never gotten it, and they would, they would head on their way. Right. Even though what I was doing was things. doing it without right. a permit, doing it without any, you know, protocols. Right. So there's not. 
if you're doing something larger scale, chopping down trees, burning, yeah, maybe you might run right. into more trouble. Although we should be burning. Hmm? We should be burning for blueberries and everything else. We should be burning back Fire all the blueberries. Blueberries. Fire yeah. Fire. Sustainable forest management. She won't give. So That's bringing it back to, to uh, this pork fest uh, situation, I guess I really wanted to stress the fact that you can uh, really resist um, supporting corporations, which are absolutely one and the same with the government, large corporations such as Walmart, they are the government. and Coca-Cola, and Nestle, and Monsanto. These are people are evil, and they are our enemies, as, as <laughs> with everyone else. And growing your own food, knowing where it comes from, knowing where the seeds come from, knowing that you know, the genes and that seed are owned by anyone else. Right. Um, filtering your own water, managing, uh, sustainably managing your own water, taking care of your soil, growing your own medicine, stop <coughs> supporting the pharmaceutical industry and the insurance companies. And we can really use ecosystem dynamics to rise above and resist corporations, the corporatocracy, and um, and then we'll be resilient, as collectively resilient, because we'll have some really necessary skills that can really help support us in, in uh, through some of these hard times that we're beginning to face. Right. So as we work together and network, we're all going to have individual skills. There's so much to learn, but right. we can all work together and more and hands make light like work and we can have work parties. We can drink exactly. beer and do work at the same time. I mean, come on. I know together. several farms that do that. Like, come help us out. Free beer and pizza. Hey, let's, yeah, let's have some really like, fresh, organic, local food that didn't depend on petroleum to get here. And, right. uh, you know, uh, petrochemicals. And, and when you think of what a basic need food is to everybody here, you know, no one can once you have that locked food. down, yeah. <laughs> the solution. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Does, does permaculture cover something like heavy mulching to never have to water and weed? And yeah, it's what, a lot of no-till type um, yeah. gardening. Yeah. What are some of the time-saving suggestions for both permaculture? Um, one thing I can think of right off the bat is that if you're harvesting a crop, cut it off at the root, leave the root in the soil because it actually decomposes under the soil and adds nourishes the soil for the next year's crop. But there are all, all oh, kinds of great. stuff you can do. Yeah, a lot of times people, they'll begin a garden and they will take a rototiller and till up a section of lawn. Right. Which is cool, whatever, but the, the seeds are all still in there and so you're still going to get grass coming up. And, and one thing that we suggest is a pretty basic permaculture practice is sheet mulching. Yes. And uh, there are different ways that people implement this practice, but uh, a lot of times, you know, what I do is uh, put cardboard, take the tape off, and I usually, I use cardboard, and I don't usually, I use like water-based inks or, or cardboard with no inks, corrugated cardboard, take all the tape off, because it's plastic, petrochemicals, and uh, put it on the grass, the grass will die and eventually give back to the soil, uh, and there'll still be room to breathe. Um, worms eat through the cardboard and use it as food and it also decomposes and adds carbon to the soil. And then over that you put some compost. There's about uh, that many. And then uh, you can, uh, you know, put... You use like wood chips or some type of other mulch. Wood chips. It. Or it depends on what you're doing. There's a few different options of how you do it. But yeah, you, just, you know, you might want to put the manure um, below the cardboard or on top or it depends on what you're doing. But, I mean, the purpose of the cardboard is to kill off whatever's there so you don't want it there anymore. And it's kind of go away. And it will just add to the soil, and you don't have to remove it. <laughs> Are you basically saying that if we want a revolution, we have to get our hands dirty? You can have to get your hands dirty. <laughs> yeah, you need to get some brushes to clean your fingernails out, because. Uh, Today my finger, my hands are pretty clean, but normally. But, yeah, but the idea though too about like no till in general is how often people familiar with it is. Um, I mean, when you go out in the woods or something like that, you know, there's no one out there digging up the soil constantly. And it doesn't work that way in nature. You know, when we're going to like, think of like a standard farm, you know, someone's going out there and rototilling it up, and you know they're exposing the soil, to, like um, destroying all the existing paths that are in the soil that the worms created for water and things to flow through. Um, Playing the same crop over and over. You're, you're exposing actually the soil all to a bunch of new oxygen, so bacteria is starting to go crazy that would not, normally wouldn't go and start eating a lot of the organic matter in there, which is your fertilizer. So the, the no-till approach is really you're kind of just layering, trying to never disturb, and um, you know just keep sort of stacking stuff on top, and just sort of the way the forest would be. Yeah. yeah. And actually, um, for you specifically, um, because you asked about like no-till and stuff, um, there's a concept that Amelia, her name is Amelia Hazlip, she's French, but she coined something which is basically permaculture, but she refers to it as synergistic agriculture. 
if you Google that, you might be able to find a really cool documentary that, uh, that she made about her farm and the way it functions and how they don't need to do any tilling at all. Have you guys heard of lasagna garden yet? Yeah. It's just it's awesome. compost and green malt and compost green malt. Right. You just plant right in it. And you just keep adding to it. Wonderful. Huge advantage of no-till gardening for people with kids is if you don't have to dig, kids like it more. Because guess who gets to do a lot of the digging? Right. <laughs> My dad probably would have gotten every one of us <laughs> if he had uh, made us dig. The ragamuffin and the button up. Um, we've got another concept going on that would actually help close the loop, too, and Dave and I are working on this, and that's the Shire Co-op. So the idea is, we, we had a talk on it earlier, but I still wanted to pass around the sign-up sheet. If you are producing something, you can be a producer member of the co-op. If you're consuming something, you can be a consumer member of the co-op. So we're getting it all set up. We have about 16 members, and we're really testing out the system. But Dave found some great uh, open source software for setting that up. So if anybody's interested in the Shire Co-op, we're on Facebook, or we can pass around the sign-up sheet. And I'm only adding that because I think it's complementary to the yeah. permaculture thing. Absolutely. Well, it's out of time. Yeah, that's right. I need to bear bad news. <laughs> Thank, you Thank you very much. much.